Hi, it's Simon, and welcome to the Conflict Skills Podcast. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about how to reduce rumination, particularly related to conflict. I do workplace uh, mediations myself, and I'd spend a lot of time doing conflict resolution training. And a lot of people who come for training or people who are in mediation are just stressed out of their minds. Like, work for a lot of people is intense. Like, In a practical sense, you might be just rushing from emergency to emergency and dealing with situations where you're short staffed and you've got pressure on you to do more and more with the same time that you've had available. And I don't honestly know what some organizations expect. It, It literally is like a rubber band that they think they can just keep stretching. And well, what we're seeing, I think, is that a lot of people are starting to become a bit overly stretched. Uh, and in some cases, the, the, I mean, I don't want to brush over this, like it's an incredibly sad part is that they snap. They've had enough and they might not even actually be aware of this sort of stress and tension that's being created in them. It's like the frog in the boiling water that's not aware of it as it gradually increases. And burnout is something that really does creep up on a lot of people. And so when I'm talking about rumination, I really do see this as one of the early warning signs that you may be heading towards burnout if you're not able to sort of find a way to manage this effectively. There are tools that you can use. I'll I'll talk about one particular approach today. And it's really related to the cognition, the, the thinking. In other words, the story that we're telling ourselves about the situation. And then as a result, the way that we feel, and then as a result, the way that that tends to ripple back like an echo bouncing off a wall and coming back and hitting us again. The way that we feel is connected to our thoughts and behavior. In a lot of the episodes on this podcast, I talk about behavioral options like protocols that you can use to reset after conflict, for example, the type of breathing that might be useful or adopting a body posture that triggers the release of testosterone and decreases the release of cortisol. Yes, and that helps. And even for rumination, it might be worth considering exercise, for example, or something like yoga, where you need to concentrate on your breathing and calm yourself down at the same time as doing challenging poses. You can just watch YouTube, do it yourself at home. You don't need to pay for anything. You don't need to go and join a class if that's something that you'd find embarrassing or unpleasant. I, I have never gone to a yoga class and I really would dread it, to be honest. And Um, What I do is just watch YouTube and do it in my bedroom. And my goodness, it's been a powerful help for me in reducing things like rumination. So if you're experiencing rumination, considering some options on the behavioral side, probably the types of exercise that burn off a little bit of that adrenaline that's built up within your system. But today we're thinking about thoughts. And it's really in line with the way that we think about ourselves and therefore what it means to be in the conflict situation that we're in. What tends to happen when we're in conflict is that we experience it as a threat. And when I talk about threats, I'm not just talking about physical threats, although they're certainly there. We might literally feel like the customer standing over the top of us might um, punch us. We might literally be worried that the contractor that we're dealing with on the construction site might flip their lid and just, you know, become violent. Um, So that's there. There are other physical types of threats though too, like exhaustion, discomfort, like being outside in really hot, uncomfortable conditions. Maybe the whole team comes back in for a drink and you ask one of them to go back out and get something that they left back into the sun. That's the kind of situation that can be perceived as a threat, of course. It might be hunger, it might be boredom, all of these different factors. If we think about the potential to experience discomfort, that's something that we experience as threatening. And it makes sense because historically we weren't within this same contained structured environment like an office at work. You know, we're out in a field and if we started to get itchy, that was a real serious warning sign that we might have eaten something poisonous or we might be brushing up against leaves that are you know, causing us harm. So we've had to pay attention to discomfort really carefully throughout evolution. And today, unfortunately, our systems are still pretty finely tuned to trying to avoid this as much as possible. You particularly see it in kids, you know, they, my son just desperately wants to avoid any situation where he has to sit for five minutes and just be bored. (laughs) When he gets hungry, it is like meltdown mode, you know, if he doesn't get some food in his system pretty quickly. 
I wonder if that's because they were more vulnerable historically and so they needed to be more reactive to potential threats like discomfort, hunger, boredom, loneliness and isolation, that kind of thing, who knows. Um, so there's the physical threats. It might be emotional threats like embarrassment and rejection, maybe a team going out for lunch and not inviting you, or you need to stand up in front of your colleagues and give a presentation. It might be having a difficult conversation with a customer and they're yelling and you've, you're aware of other people around in the store watching you. It might be see, seeing some someone do the wrong thing and you just felt helpless in the moment and so you didn't do anything. And, and so therefore we worry about, well, there's a guilt and shame factor that's connected to, well, this behavior was out of line with what's expected from within my tribe and that's oriented towards survival. So we might have a, that threat response to emotional threats like that, embarrassment, rejection, that kind of thing, isolation. Uh, it could also be in response to uncertainty when we're not sure what to expect. That's the other area that can often trigger a pretty similar fight or flight response. So when we're in these types of situations that involve one of those threats, this um, threat response becomes activated in our in our body. It's the uh, sympathetic nervous system. Uh, it's activating us to get ready for action. It releases adrenaline. There's a buildup of physical energy ready to fight the threat or run away because that's been suitable through a lot of situations involving threats historically. But if it's something like a job interview, that's not ideal. So I'm in a job interview, there's this potential for embarrassment, rejection, um, there's a lot of pressure on, I certainly would experience that as threatening. And so in the moment, what happens is that the memory becomes imprinted with the level of threat that I perceived in the moment. I'll say that again, that memory becomes imprinted with the level of threat that I perceived in the moment. This is also something like a mechanism that we've developed throughout evolution. If you've seen an animal's tracks outside your tent, and it might be a bear or something that's going to eat you in your sleep, your brain is hypervigilant to any other information that comes in related to those footprints, right? If you hear a rustle in the bushes, you'll quickly jump out of bed and get ready to defend yourself. Whereas if you thought, saw the tracks and you knew that they were two months old and Actually, it was your son drawing bear prints outside the tent and bears don't actually exist in this part of the country. Then you wouldn't have that same perceived threat in the moment, right? It's just the perceived threat. It might be exactly the same trigger, but your perception is different. So therefore, it doesn't become imprinted with that high level of threat. When a memory does become imprinted with that high level of threat, it echoes back to us from the past. It's like we remind ourselves about this thing that might be potentially dangerous. Of course, that's good for survival. We should be hypervigilant to things that are actual threats. The challenge is that a lot of us perceive threat today for things that aren't actually as threatening as we think that they are. Like weird little situations. I know when I pick my son up from school, all of the parents are gathered around the school and there's just this awkward moment because I don't really know everybody's names. I, there's people that you recognize and you say hello and there's people who find me to want to make conversation and small talk. And sometimes I'm in the middle of something at work. I've just gone to pick up my son and I'm wanting to get back to it to continue. And I am pretty frustrated, to be honest, about the distraction of this person wanting to talk to me. It sounds horrible, but that's where my head's at in the moment, right? Anyway, I, I feel a real sense of threat then as they approach me because it might be taking my time. And so I perceive this as threatening. And so what tends to happen then as I'm lying awake, uh, lying in bed trying to get to sleep, but my brain is buzzing, it these threats echo back to us. I remember this guy approaching me and that feeling of, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Can I somehow get out of this? Quick, grab your phone, pretend that you're on a call or something like that. Um, so this adrenaline gets released. I'm almost in this sense of panic. You can hear me laughing because rationally I can hear just how silly this all is, but we're working with antiquated hardware. And so this imprinting just goes on unconsciously, unfortunately. We can't stop it from happening. And you know what else? We can't stop ourselves reacting in any situation that we're in because we're also dealing with the echoes of all of these past perceived threats. 
Um, but what we can do is to try and be aware of it through something like reflection or meditation, just spending 10 minutes in a room, being quiet, sitting down <laughs> and watching the patterns in your thoughts. It's almost like you go and sit in the movie theater and you watch which memories keep coming back again and again. And we can understand the reason why these are the popular movies that keep getting played repeatedly. It's because they were perceived as threatening in the past. So I talked about in the moment, there's this imprinting that happens where we imprint the level of perceived threat with the event, and therefore it gets translated back to memory. The thing is that memory is malleable, it's changeable. And so we can re-imprint over the top of the original imprint, a new perceived threat. And so the ways that we can do this is either through our thinking, like reminding ourselves that that's all said and done. Uh, there's no point spending time remembering that job interview that we were unsuccessful in. After all, two days later, we went for another one and we've got the job, but our brain keeps trying to remind us of that one that we failed. We've got this orientation towards negativity, unfortunately. Being pessimistic has been something that's really important. If you don't know when your food's going to grow again, you should eat really carefully. You shouldn't assume that it's going to rain. Uh, we tend to therefore still have that real negative lens of looking at different experiences. I know when I do a training workshop, I, I thankfully often get quite positive feedback, and but I really focus in on the 6 out of 10 or the 7 out of 10 if, if the rest of them were 10 out of 10 kind of thing. And I beat myself up and pull out the microscope and try and figure out what did I say to that person and who might it have been that gave that score and what could I have done differently and how unfair this all is because obviously they've just been sent to the training and what does the manager expect? It's like I just almost live this experience again in my thinking. So what I can do is jump in when that's happening and just stop it, just gently remind myself that that's past now. It was certainly an uncomfortable situation, but my goodness, what's the point of adding more discomfort to it and more stress by reimagining myself going through it again? And so I just sort of respectfully press pause and go and put the put the file back in the folder. <laughs> I put the DVD back in the case for those of us old enough to remember that. Um, I, I close the notebook that seems to be just rewriting this thing again and again. And then what I do is turn to the physical side, which is just physically relaxing. Take a few deep breaths using your nose, really concentrate on the breath out. And with each breath, try and breathe out for a little bit longer and take a little bit longer for the breath in and the breath out. Pause in between. What you'll notice is that your heart rate just naturally slows and your physical body starts to relax as well. And what we've done is sort of added a little bit more of that next imprint that we want to be added on top which is being calm and composed. It was a pretty crap situation back then, yes. Uh, there's no point re-experiencing it. And so I'm re-imprinting this thing that I'm safe, it's under control, I got through it, and I can get through it again, it'll be okay. Even if I don't get the job, even if I run into this person again tomorrow at school pickup, uh, I can deal with it, right? It's an unconscious process, so there's nothing more needed than that. It's reminding yourself that it's, this is in the past and it's not going to be helpful to re-experience it and directing your focus back to the present and then calming yourself down physically, doing that deep breathing, do a quick body scan, go through the different bits of your body and just check in how you feel. Is there tightness in your shoulders or are your legs feeling sore? It's just orienting our focus in the present, which stops that echo from resonating as often and bouncing around in our head and getting louder and uglier. The same thing happens for the future, by the way. I, I tend to think more about the past in terms of rumination, but a very similar thought, or not thought process, it's like thought feeling behavior process happens. The sympathetic nervous system gets activated for things in the future as well like some difficult conversation that you've got coming up tomorrow or that horrible family event where you'll have to spend time dealing with these awkward cousins that you can't really remember all of their kids' names or being angry in advance about your husband that always is late and you want to be on time for these kind of things and just because he can't get his act together, you're always at least 15 minutes late. 
We pre-feel, <laughs> we imagine what this is going to be like in our head. We sit down in the movie theater and that's what comes on and we experience it again. We have conversations with people in our head, in our imagination. We um, think about what the room might look like and where we should sit and what's a good plan for in the morning and what do we need to tell our kids to make sure that they get their act together and we're not late because of them. And we experience the emotions that go along with this too, the stress and the discomfort and the um, like tense, pent up discomfort of being on edge or under scrutiny or having things happen that are completely outside of your control. And the approach that we would take for dealing with those sort of pre-feeling ruminations, the imagining what it's going to be like, is very similar. We remind ourselves that however unpleasant and uncomfortable that situation is going to be, there is no benefit in me feeling it now. Like I want to limit my discomfort where possible, which means leaving that event in the future, which is where it belongs. It's coming anyway. <laughs> um, actually, what I'm not going to help is me really ramping it up in my head so that when it arrives, I'm so stressed out of my mind that I probably make it even worse. Blurting out something at the dinner table when someone's talking about a political idea that I disagree with or something like that. So we bring ourselves back to the present, focus on your senses. What can you hear? What can you see? What can you smell? Do some deep breathing and calm yourself back down. And we're putting the file back in the folder. <laughs> it's like defragging the system. We're just sorting these memories from the past and all of these events that are coming up in the future into the place that they belong. And when our mind is a little bit more ordered, we tend to feel more in control. It reduces the sense of perceived threat and that sense of just sitting there being on edge. And what you might notice is that after you can break through the first echo, the first wall of these memories or these future events and just get through it, just write it out, just recognize that this is just an echo coming back, we understand why it's happening, then all we have to do is calm ourselves down and tolerate it in the moment, even when it feels uncomfortable, orient our attention back towards something that's going to be more helpful, connect our focus to the present, and it helps us to endure it. And then this is the re-imprinting that happens. We break through that first wall and then the next echo that comes through is just so much more manageable. Then over time, it does start to decrease and we don't continue to re-experience and re-experience and re-experience all of these difficult traumatic situations from our childhood, the small T traumas, the realizing that you forgot your lunch or you've worn the wrong socks or your parents aren't there to pick you up when you're expected or something embarrassing happens at the sports game. We've imprinted this sense of threat in all of these memories and a lot of us re-experience them again and again and again until we decide to do something about it. So I hope that that's been helpful for you talking about some of the ways that we can adapt our thinking to deal with rumination and some of the behavioral options then that go along with it once we understand why this happens and what we can do about it. If you've got a question, a scenario that you'd like me to discuss in a future episode of the podcast, a different topic that you'd like me to cover, you can email podcast at simongood.com. It's S-I-M-O-N for Simon, G-O-O-D-E, so there's an E on the end for good. Thank you so much for listening. I hope to sort of meet you again virtually in a future episode of the podcast. Bye for now.